1030 mark here on uh, Friday, June 5th. And uh, I expect that there will be a few more folks joining us as the as the morning progresses, but I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to Facilitated Solutions second last, the penultimate as it were, uh, session in our Facilitated Fridays series for this spring, uh, spring 2020. We're coming to you again from our various office spaces here in uh, Winnipeg and look forward to our conversation today about some pretty fundamental basic conflict management ideas. So for some of you joining us, this might be a refresher or review, but we find time and time again that in our work, it really is a lack of practicing some of these most basic common sense ideas like managing our self-talk, practicing curiosity, active listening. These are the things that continue to keep the lights on at Facilitated Solutions. So we believe there's some real value in uh, reviewing these concepts and practicing them because let's face it, common sense is not always common practice as they say. So as always, um, our materials from today are going to be posted up on our website, um, including a recording of the conversation today, um, as well as the uh, the PowerPoint slides and uh, any other supplementary uh, resources that we have for you. Uh, my name is Sandy Coop Harder, and uh, I'm here today again with my two business partners, David Falk and Dave Dick. You two want to say a quick hello? Hello, it's Dave Dick here. Nice to see you all again. Some people starting to come in, some familiar faces, a couple new people. Look forward to the next 90 minutes with you. Likewise, good to see you. I think I've got things uh, floating on Facebook. So hello to the Facebook um, streamers. We should uh, have a go in there. Excellent. Beautiful. Um, so in addition to Dave, David, and myself, uh, the core of our FS team here is, uh, includes uh, Janine Hoogsantergrat and uh, Eleanor Moore, as well as Charlene Gunter. I think we have a quick slide that shows our... Um, our team here. Um, we have a couple of websites that uh, uh, that overview our work. Um, uh, www.workplaceconflict.ca and familyconflict.ca are, are, is where you can find information about our services in for workplaces and for families. Um, so we're going to dive into our content for today in just a moment, but before I pass the mic over to David, we wanted to just take a moment because silence means complicity to, to recognize the events of the past few weeks and indeed the experience of many, many people over many, many years. Specifically, we want to acknowledge and call out the personal and systemic racism an active oppression in our world, not just in the US and not just the killing of George Floyd, but around the world for centuries, including today, including in Canada, and including in Winnipeg. We're committed at FS to listening and to learning and to acting for justice because Black Lives Matter. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to David. Thank you, Sandy. So today, as Sandy said, we are diving into some absolute fundamentals in terms of conflict conversations with one another, whether this is with your peeps at home or whether this is with your people at work or out in the community. And um, I think the relevance of this is, is just huge. It's daily. Um, on good days, we need these skills. And when things are really tough, we need these skills. Um, so I want to start off with sharing with you a bit of a plumbing diagram. This is like a schematic that when I was first introduced to this idea, it was in a textbook in my university days when I was studying basic interpersonal conflict resolution. And honestly, when I first read it in the book, I'm like, meh, it left me a little cold. Um, didn't seem the most relevant. It's one of these things that you wonder, you know, do I need to study this for the exam or not? It was that kind of experience that I had. And about two years later, as I was a young professional in the field, I attended a workshop where a facilitator presented this model 
um, instead of me just reading it. And I had this, oh my goodness, there is my whole life on one piece of paper. So I, I really hope that in sharing this model with you today that you might have the, oh my goodness, there's my life on one screenshot as opposed to the first kind of experience I had with this model. So this, this um, uh, particular material, uh, I was first introduced to it from an old book called Connecting with Self and Others. And it's this map that maps out essentially any relationship, whether it's a workplace relationship or home or community relationship. And as I walk through this, I encourage you just kind of hold one or two of your own kind of personal examples in mind and uh, getting a sense of where we have kind of these tricky moments, uh, moments that are both dangerous and also have opportunity for some insight and some growth. So here we go. This is um, this lovely little plumbing diagram goes like this. All relationships start with information gathering, whether it's a real obvious situation, such as when you are applying for a job, you gather information on the job opportunity. And when you gather information, you start forming expectations and assumptions about what that job would be like and what working in that workplace would be like. Would be better than what you're currently doing, better than your current opportunity. Would you fit? Um, into the culture? Would it be a place where you would thrive, where your skills and, val you know, skills and values and personality would be appreciated or not? Uh, and guess what? In an interview, they're gathering information on you um, and getting a sense of whether you would be kind of what they're looking for and a good fit as well. And if it's a match, there's a commitment. You're offered the job and you say yes. If it's not a match, uh, they don't call you back <laughs> and or they call you back and offer the job. But after you've kicked the tires and sniffed around, you're like, mm -mm, I'd rather stay with what I'm doing than work there. And so there's no commitment. It's that's the end of the relationship at the front end. The same thing happens in personal relationships, whether that is meeting people in person or swiping left or right on some profile pic. Um, we are gathering information and in the process of gathering information, forming expectations and assumptions about what it would be like if we engaged in relationship with that other individual or with that organization. And some of that information that we gather and the expectations that we uh, um, form are shared and articulated expectation. These are the hours of work. This is the pay you will be remunerated at. And others of those expectations are unspoken. There are what we expect, what we hope, what we anticipate, um, fully assume will be happening in part of that relationship, um, be it a workplace or a personal relationship. And life goes on. And there's, you know, some folks talk about the honeymoon period in personal relationships where everything is awesome. Um, same thing uh, within a workplace where you're just thrilled to have a job and things are stable, things are productive, things are as you expect it. And the guarantee in life is that your stability and productivity will at some point or sooner or later, often a whole lot sooner, it will be shooken up. And the thing that will disrupt your stability is quite simply this, a pinch. And the key attribute of a pinch is pinches are private. That means that the person who is feeling the pinch is the only one who for sure knows that is happening. So when something happens where your expectations are not met, someone does something at the workplace that you did not expect them to do and you feel let down or disappointed or offended or worse, it is a pinch moment. You know it's happening because you're feeling it. Um, and pinches could be acts of omission, where someone doesn't do something you expect, or commission, where they do something you didn't expect. And pinches are just this super significant moment, because um, there's a disruption in kind of the harmony. There's a disruption in things being stable and productivity. And it's fascinating looking at how we kind of handle pinches. I love having conversations with people within intact work teams around how do you handle these moments within your workplace? And the reality is that often the list of things that we get in terms of how people handle this uh, kind of cycles around some of these things of people complain to someone else. You know, I don't go and talk about a pinch. I go to the individual who offended me. I talk to everyone else first. And so the person who maybe said the offending comment or didn't meet your expectations is the last person to know. And so it just feeds into this idea of workplace gossip, right? Or sometimes pinches, we just quite simply let them go, or at least we tell ourselves that we're letting it go. Ah, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a, a microaggression, as they call it. Ah, but sometimes we're not actually letting those things go. And it's actually not that micro. It is something that is sticking with it. It's starting to accumulate as this is annoying. 
this is violating my sense of how things should be within this workplace or within this personal relationship. So we tell ourselves we're just letting it go, but in reality, we're starting to gunny sack. We're starting to collect and hold on to those issues. Um, sometimes uh, what we do is we uh, uh, crunch back. We take this moment and we start, as we start accumulating pinch moments, we start accumulating these difficult experiences. Uh, and we move from just simply having a pinch to having a disruption of expectations because when something happens that doesn't meet your expectations uh, let's say you feel like you've been uh, significantly disrespected in a team meeting something happens on your latest zoom meeting or in-person meeting where you felt slammed where you felt um, uh, slighted or shut down and not in a way that you would expect to be treated by that colleague or by that supervisor if you hang on to it if you don't recover and deal with it if you're not able to either clear the air, you might just start hanging on to that. And next time you have that meeting on Zoom, you're not coming in with the same kind of energy, um, the same type of enthusiasm or looking forward to the conversation. You might come in with a bit more anxiety or fear of, is today gonna be respectful? Or is it gonna happen again? Will this supervisor or this colleague slight me or um, disrespect me a second time? And so within that pressure, as our expectations are kind of rattled and where uh, the ground becomes less stable, uh, eggshells maybe uh, as a way of thinking about it pressure starts building we're vulnerable to things going crunch and the difference between a pinch and a crunch is pinches are private moments where the one person who for sure knows it's happening is the person who's feeling it who's experiencing the disappointment or offense crunch moments are the public expressions of open conflict uh, this is where people have the open argument of someone calling someone else out or confronting them on something and anyone that's included um, in the meeting or on the email thread knows that, oh my, these two folks have a problem. And when we have crunch moments, a couple other options kind of kick in. There might be the I quit, you're fired moment um, or the messy breakup in the personal relationship department where you have the fight and someone leaves. There is the kiss and makeup mode where <clears throat> we have the open conflict and that scares me because I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to lose my relationship. So I go to restabilize things and I go to restabilize things by recommitting to the relationship. And often there's some type of apology that might be paired with this movement. But the key thing is in this moment, people are apologizing for their mm, bad behavior in the crunch moment. Often what we're not talking about is the buildup of unmet expectations that led to the disruption of expectations that built up to the point where we actually it had this difficult, unprofessional exchange. And so I might say to my colleague, you know what, I'm so sorry, I've just been so stressed with everything going on in the world and with COVID and, and yeah, I was just, I spoke out of turn yesterday, my bad. And it's great, I stabilized the relationship, but the trouble is that I haven't been honest, I haven't cleared up any of the things that were building up that weren't about COVID at all, that weren't about the things that are on my social media feed that are causing me distress, that are these actual unmet expectations, these pinch moments that I've been holding on to. And so my colleague thinks things are great, um, but they're still not great. I haven't lost the relationship, but it's still perking. And we run the risk of having things happen again because they haven't received feedback to change up their behavior. or We haven't received information to change the way we're interpreting their past behavior. So we have still this accumulation of now, discomfort of unmet expectations. So the kiss and make up, the quick recovery mode. Then there's this one, and this was oh, chronic within so many workplaces and also unfortunately personal relationships where we just lower our expectations. I don't want to be frustrated with pinch moments. I don't want to have an open fight. So if I don't hope for much, you can't hurt me. And so this is where we just start putting in time where we might play the good thing is game. Well, the good thing is, is I have a job especially during this time, I have a job, I'm able to pay rent. Or the good thing is, is I have a relationship with someone that's in my bubble. Yeah, it's not perfect, but what relationship is perfect? And we just start lowering our expectations. And there's a time and place for reality, for just going, hey, absolutely, there is no perfect relationship or any perfect job. And our job, I think, in life is try to make our lives and our world uh, as best as they can be, given that we all are trying to live in this highly imperfect world. Um, and make it taste a little less bitter. Uh, so there's a good part of that, of managing our expectations and not having unrealistic expectations. But I've also met people who are counting time 
where they can tell me down to the hour of how long they have left until they get their magic numbers can retire. And don't take me wrong. I think it's great if you got your retirement plans. That's good. Good to have your, you know, know what, how many months you got left. But when you're counting down time and you're still at 18 years, three months and four days and three and a half hours, like there's a problem with that. Because we start thinking in kind of penitentiary kind of thoughts, seeing our jobs as prison terms. In 18 years, at least in Canada, you'd have got to do some serious stuff to have that type of a oh, time incarceration. And so it, it's not a helpful um, kind of way of existing in the world within one's workplace. I think it comes at a fairly high cost to our personal relationships or workplace relationships when we're just purely in that lowering expectation. So great short-term coping mechanism. Hmm. maybe a not ideal way of living out a career or living out a long-term relationship. And then there's, of course, the um, additional strategy of post a crunch, having a conversation. And the, the key thing about having a conversation when you're trying to recover from a crunch is that it's about gathering information. That's the spirit of a good conversation is I want to engage you in here. So what were you thinking? This is what I was thinking. What were you assuming? This is what I was assuming. What were you expecting? This is what I was expecting. And there's a clarification of what we've gone through where we might need to unpack some past pinches or talk about what led up to that disappointment. Um, make sense of maybe some of our not great behavior, of what we did um, when things kind of blew up and became an open conflict. But there is that learning kind of conversation. This isn't a conversation where you're trying to win. This is a conversation where we're trying to get some insight and some learning. And from that, we might have a renewed and clarified commitment of going, okay, so going forward, this is how we're gonna go forward in a better way. Or sometimes this might be the clarifying conversation where you realize, oh boy, my values and how I want to engage my work is not in alignment with the culture of this organization. And I need to find as graceful as an exit out of here and engage something that's gonna be a better fit and more life-giving for me, or I need to engage a different process to try to compel my organization to change. So when I was first, um, or not first, actually my second time being uh, Ill, uh, given this, uh, this map, I realized, oh my goodness, I have so much experience in life over on the left-hand side of this chart of unmet expectations, times where it's, yeah, we had a, it kind of blow up and I left, times where I just kind of put up with it and went, well, it's a short-term summer job, let me get through this thing times where I did the kiss and make up, <laughs> just hoping things would be better and then cycling through it a second time. And what I didn't have as much experience with is a more proactive swinging around this side, taking the initiative when I'm the person who's been offended, instead of sitting on it, instead of collecting um, pain and allowing it to run the risk of it becoming open conflict, proactively trying to check out the situation to see, is this a misunderstanding where I took something wrong? Is this a simple mistake where someone misstepped and when I say, hey, what's going on? They're able to recover with me. Or when I try to check it out, is it something that is actually a bigger issue where we need to surface maybe um, some fundamental disagreements we have around our roles and responsibilities, around our expectations, around how we do life together at work or at home, where we need to actually gather information and clarify our commitments and figure out, can we get back into a stable, productive, decent space? Or is this a point where, yeah, no, it's not working and we need, to, we need to kind of go our separate ways, if you will. So my hope is that uh, as you look at this, you can map out and kind of see any number of relationships that you might be in right now or have traveled in the past and see some of the patterns of where you've been in the past and see also not only past patterns, but also potentially opportunities. And so today we kind of want to really put an emphasis on understanding this pinch moment um, and trying to unpack what you can do with that pinch, what makes dealing with those pinch moments difficult and hard when it's yours. And if we've got time at the end of the session, also looking at what can you do when other people come to you complaining about the pinch that they've had from someone else, because that's such a common dynamic. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and so that's, that's kind of our map, our anchor map for the morning. So Dave or Sandy, any kind of additional clarifications or things that you want to add into the spin of this little map? 
I think you covered it. I'll only say likewise. I had the exact same experience as David when I saw it on a piece of paper. I was like, eh. And then as I started to flesh it out, I realized how much can be can be built around this map, including your conflict intervention or responses and things like coaching, which we may get to later, uh, mediation and, and negotiation. They all can fit in here in some in some pretty neat ways that help you get like, I always think of it as a 20,000 foot view of the whole situation, right? You're, look, you're up in the plane, you're looking down at it. And I find that super helpful on one page. So no, David, thank you though. That was, uh, that's where I'm coming from too. Yep. Awesome. So Dave, why don't you uh, take that pinch moment and put it underneath the microscope for us. And I think this is probably what you're going to share with us is the first postcard I think we ever made because we got tired of drawing this little diagram on post-it notes and flip charts in absolutely every mediation we've been doing. There it is, postcard number one. So Dave, walk us through that one. Some of you may remember SETV. But <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, that's going back in the day, my friend. It's going back. So, no, uh, active check. I mean, we could show you a slide of this. Maybe we will in a moment. Dave's going to pop it up. We have it on a card. Uh, I, uh, not perspective check. Sure, the pin will come to the back momentarily. Sandy's going to take us through that. But just the pinch moment, I've thought of this over the years as the anatomy of a pinch. So if you took a pinch and opened it up, what would you find? In, I think pretty much every pinch moment that, as David said, uh, someone has failed to meet our expectations. Uh, Maybe because we assume them, uh, the expectations without saying them out loud. Sometimes we don't even realize we have the expectation until it's violated. Right? Uh, it be because we name the clearly, but the person's still doing this. And what so um, inside of that though, if you stop any moment, if you think about any human in play communications could be looked at there's a and there's a public sphere. There's things that chart form before you take action or your impact affected by someone else's decision to communicate. That's all going that's an action that you could you uh, that you observe, which then could have an impact back in the in the private sphere. So, what gets us into trouble with this model, or with this situation with pinches, is the tendency we all have to assume that my action landed the way I intended. Like I know my my intentions were were decent, maybe even good, maybe even downright noble, or at least neutral. I meant to get something done. I meant to communicate something. And so I assume that that is the way it's going to land. And that's a dangerous assumption because, you know, most of the time it, it, it does not. I should, I should say, if we went around in life being completely jumpy or scared, or if I dare even say paranoid that any interaction is not landing the way we intended, obviously that would drive us nuts. If David says to me at a meeting, uh, hey, Dave, do you know where the bathroom is? And I'm like, yeah, it's around the corner. He's not going to start second guessing whether his uh, question landed with me the way it was intended. It's pretty safe to say it has. So that's one danger. A second danger though, um, is that when we've been impacted negatively by someone else's behavior, and, it, and it, it, for some reason it doesn't work for us, it leaves us feeling bad, it leaves us feeling thrown um, or offended or embarrassed or whatever the word is, there is a tendency person who did it, did it intentionally, or they are um, either either malicious, incompetent, or ignorant, right? If you think about that, malicious is they meant to do it, incompetent is they maybe didn't mean to do it, but they should know how not to do that. Um, and ignorant is, yeah, they just they just don't know better, and they do stupid things, right? But anyway, there's an, a, ju a judgment being made. There's an assumption that she or he knows how I would be impacted. They did this anyway, um, and we start attributing negative motivation or negative things to them. This is problematic, right? So that's essentially what a pinch is all, uh, a pinch moment is all about. I just want to add, and before I turn it over to Sandy here, um, who's going to talk about what do you do about this in a detailed flow. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we want to create space as parents, as leaders, um, as community members, as volunteers, you may be a part of a religious group, whatever, wherever human beings gather, this phenomenon is in effect. So we want to create space to make the private, uh, sorry, to make the private public. 
We want to make space and create safe space to listen to what someone's uh, intentions might be and to hear how that other person was impacted. And from there, we find as soon as you start to do that, it tends to shift the dynamic from one of, well, I know that he or she is a schmuck. Sorry, that's a strong Yiddish term. Uh, I know this person is a fool or an idiot or um, a mean-spirited person to going, oh, wait a minute, maybe they didn't intend that exactly as it landed with me. I got to slow down. Or, uh, well, that I don't care if that person, if that person's going to take offense at that, that's their problem. I know what I did was done for some good reasons. You start to hear how you're imp you, you impacted that person and what kind of concerns and fears have been raised. And it softens people a little bit. They start to take their armor off. That's why we want to make create space to make the private public and have those conversations, kind of erase that line. So Sandy's going to talk to us about exactly how to do that, right? Is that right, David, in terms of next? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe before we uh, dive to Sandy, my one comment would be sometimes uh, people don't have great intentions. You know, right. Sometimes the intent is, I am trying to hurt you. And typically in our experience, that's because they've been hurt and they're trying to give you a taste of their own medicine, right? It's like, I'm going to educate you. You pinched me, so I'm going to pinch you back. Um, and so one of the things that I've uh, found really helpful in our work within workplace mediations is to always go back and ask the question, was there a time when things were okay? You know, so you're, essentially you're asking a question, was there a time when things were stable and productive? And then asking, what happened? What shifted? And typically there's one person who can tell you a story that is absolutely burnt into their mind of something that happened where the other individual said or did something um, that landed horrifically for them, that landed poorly, that was a pinch moment. And that's often the key event as mediators that we need them to unpack um, in terms of when things shifted from being okay to not okay, what happened, how did it land? And unpacking even sometimes this filter, this kind of oval here, in terms of their beliefs, their values, their past history, the reasons why they interpreted that action in the way that it was interpreted, in the way that it landed for them, and allowing the other person to express and talk about their intention about what was going on for them and why they acted in that way. I recall one um, case where the, the amount of time between um, the first kind of pinch moment where things shifted from being okay to not okay to where we were called in where folks were on stress leave and having all kinds of accusations that that person comes back from stress leave that I'm taking early retirement. It had been 15 years from the initial pinch moment to this critical juncture where it's at a point where, you know, the belief is these people cannot work with each other anymore. And there were so many acts of harm that had happened in 15 years. We didn't need to talk about those ones. But what we did need to talk about is the thing that happened 15 years prior that they had never discussed. And it was one of these oh my moments for them as they unpacked that very first moment where things went off the rails for them to understand this is what led to all the suffering over the last 15 years. Yeah, they had to talk about some of their patterns that they've done over the last 15 years, but it was so, um, so huge for them to realize where things went off the rails and how an action that, yes, was hurtful, was not intended to be done that way. Um, and uh, what was it that they could learn from it in terms of trying to recover at this late time, 15 years prior, or post, I should say, uh, and try to see if it was possible to still recover and rebuild trust in that environment. So Sandy, walk us through some thoughts on uh, how to have those hopefully not 15 years after the fact conversation, because if you're trying to clear up a pinch 15 years after the fact, you probably need a mediator with you because there's a bit of a statue of limitations saying, hey, you said something that didn't work for me. What'd you mean by it? Um, if you wait too long, it gets awkward, that conversation. So Sandy, walk us through uh, some, some techniques here. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a model um, that, that we use and teach. We use it in mediation. We teach it in our interpersonal conflict resolution kind of basic 101 courses. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's a, it's a bit of a conversation guide. And ultimately it's, it's pretty straightforward, but it's, um, but it's you know, sometimes easier said than done, right? So mm -hmm. we'll get into that in a, in a minute, but just to walk you through it for a minute. So uh, ultimately when, when you're in a, when you experience this pinch moment, when someone does something that you didn't expect or doesn't do something that you did expect, 
Um, the first key thing that we suggest, um, and I know from my own personal experience that is absolutely critical, is to kind of take a moment, get yourself grounded, and work uh, at noticing your own kind of internal dialogue and thoughts and shift from that place of judgment or certainty about what you think might be going on, the theory that you have, and, and get to a place of curiosity. Um, so that you're entering the conversation with the person, um, it, you know, it, with the spirit of openness, um, at, so that so that you can set the conversation up to go to go well. So once you've done that, um, it, it essentially, what the, the the next thing that you need to do is just check in with the person. So say, hey, you know, do you have a minute? Can we talk? Um, and then move into naming the action. So going back to the, the intent action effect model, name that action, the thing that you observed, uh, name that judgmentally. So, so what you're doing is making an observation without ascribing any interpretation to it. So it's the idea like, think about it like a video camera, the, the data that a video camera would capture. There's no you know, meaning out of that. It's just a, it's just the moment that you're describing. So I noticed um, earlier today in our meeting that you came in five minutes late. You're just naming the action without judgment or interpretation and then shifting to asking about the intent. So asking about what's going on in the private sphere for that other person. So I noticed that you came in late to our meeting five minutes just curious what's going on for you or what that was about. Pause. Give them an opportunity to kind of descri describe and disclose kind of what was going on for them. And if necessary, you might go on to describe kind of the impact of, of that moment. You know, when you come in late, it, it, we delayed the beginning of the meeting. Um, and, uh, and, and it had an impact. Sometimes you don't even need to do that. Sometimes it becomes clear in the conversation, the person says, oh, you know what, I was running late. Um, it, you know, I, I, I got jammed up on, in traffic or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I felt bad. Ultimately, what you wanna do is kind of be engaged in active listening with that person, paraphrase back, make sure you understand. As I said, describe the effect on you if, if necessary. And again, a, a final stage is, um, is requesting a, a future action that's different if, if, if that's appropriate in that moment as well. So you want to get grounded, check in, name the action non-judgmentally, ask about that, actively listen when they're describing that, um, and then if necessary, describe the effect on you uh, and others if appropriate and request an alternative action going forward, again, if necessary. Easy peasy, eh? Right? Absolutely. Huh. <laughs> it's like they should teach this in elementary school. If only life was that easy. So I think part of uh, the challenge here is just talking about what makes it so stinking difficult. Because um, it, is, it is such an easy kind of script to follow. And when I actually discipline and follow this script, the vast majority of time, I encounter one of two different things. I encounter people go, and, and email is a classic one. You get some email that you read something into it and you're like, oh my goodness. And you start getting to a bit of a sniff about the, what the person said on email. And when you pick up the phone or do a FaceTime call with them and say, hey, I got the email and you name it non-judgmentally, meaning you name the subject line. I got your email about X as opposed to, yeah, so I got this total snotty email from you or I got this unprofessional, like as soon as you start loading it with the words um, unprofessional or disrespectful, you're judging that email and you're inviting the person to get defensive and argue with you about whether their email was disrespectful or inappropriate, which is a distraction from your first mission, which is I want to first find out what their intentions were. Why did they send this to me in the first place? Where were they coming from? Before we get into a conversation about the appropriateness of their email. So that's part of the reason why it's so important to actually name their behavior, the action that's problematic in neutral, non-evaluative, non-judgmental ways so that you don't create um, defensiveness and a distraction from your first mission, which is seeking to understand. And so when I actually ask that question, saying, hey, so I got this, I wasn't sure where you're coming from, the most common responses is I get a very reasonable exp explanation from the person where they use other words. I'm like, oh, okay, that's super helpful. And I get their intentions. 
especially when you're moving it from an online format of just reading something to actually being able to hear and see and get a bit more data and a few more words around it. And or you get the unsolicited apology where just by throwing the spotlight on their behavior and you go, hey, you said this, I wasn't sure what you meant. Especially and they instantly go, you know what, my bad. I was, I fired off that email way too rushed last night and it's way too blunt. That's on me. And they own it right off the hop, which is fantastic as opposed to having an apology that comes out of a bunch of defensive explanation. So easy peasy, though it's tricky. And it's tricky for a bunch of different reasons. I think the number one kind of challenge is that it is hard to do that first shift to, towards curiosity. Because when we see the world through our eyes, when we experience it through all of our senses, we become so certain that what we're experiencing is the truth. And so we come into a conversation not seeking to understand, but I'm coming in seeking to educate. And I'm coming in with a goal of, I'm going to educate you, Sandy, that that email sucked and was inappropriate, as opposed to starting off with a posture of curiosity, even though internally I'm like, that was inappropriate shifting to the point of going, well, maybe Sandy meant it, maybe she didn't, I don't know, and asking the question first before going into education mode. So I wanna give you a, a short little uh, uh, interactive exercise. If you don't have your chat icon um, capacity up and going, I encourage you to have that on the ready. Um, and I'm gonna put a, a very simple slide up on the screen. Some of you may have seen this. And so I'm doing first round here on the chat, if you see that. Uh, I'm going to put a slide up on the screen share. I want you to read everything that's on the slide. And what I want you to look for is the number of letter Fs that you see. F as in the month February. And don't be tricky by trying to, you know, eliminate a stem off an E to pretend that an F is hidden within an E. You're just looking for the actual bona fide letter F. That's it. So this is just a simple counting exercise, okay? So I'm gonna put it up on the screen. As soon as you have your number, record in the chat, just simply you know, type in the number of Fs that you see, and uh, we'll see what we come up with. So here we go, um, round one, let's do this. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to just bump over one slide here. So here we go, read them up and put them in the chat box as soon as you got it. It's not very long. Sandy, do you see some numbers coming in? Not yet. We're Not waiting. yet? Okay, put in your numbers. <laughs> Those of you who are watching Facebook uh, stream, uh, just write down your own number. What is the number of Fs that you saw? So I'm seeing someone seeing eight, someone seeing eight, five. Anyone else jumping in on here? Six. Any other responses coming in? Someone's got a seven. Someone's saying uh, a little bit of uh, feedback there. Uh, yesterday I did it with a, uh, uh, a group and we had responses, every answer from three to seven. So here we have from six, five, oh, there we go, five, six, seven, eight. We got four different opinions um, in our small sample size here of uh, several respondents on how many Fs are on the screen. And this is just like, literally a black and white issue. There's no matter of interpretation. It's just a literally a counting exercise. And we have you know, four different opinions on how many Fs are on the screen. And one of the folks I studied with, he's like, the more I've learned about communication, the more I'm amazed that we understand each other at all. Because it's so easy to look at the same data and walk away with different conclusions. Even when it's just a simple thing of object counting. We see the world differently through our past experiences, through our beliefs and values, our education, all the things that make us us, that cause us to have the lenses that we look at the world through. Um, it's amazing that uh, uh, you know, when you actually see the things the same, that's actually almost more amazing than when you see it differently. And yet we typically assume that people are gonna see it exactly like us. And anyone who doesn't see, as I saw my first time, two Fs, you know, I saw finished and I saw files, that's it. And anyone who saw more was probably on drugs because like they're making stuff up, they're breaking the rules. And it's easy to slide into a posture of judgment when you bump into difference as opposed to going, wait, what, you saw four or you saw five, how? 
and having a positive curiosity. And for those of you who haven't seen this uh, little slide before and are curious, like, what's going on here? How many are there? Well, take a second look. In the spirit of curiosity, the ones I initially saw finished in the files, there they were. But there's also, so that's two, and then there's three, and then there's four in of, then there's five in scientific, then there's six in of, then there's seven in the title in of, and then there's an eight one, sneaky one had in over here on facilitated solutions. And so it is just a, well, a simple exercise some of you may have seen before, and yet it really does drive home this point that we see the world so easily differently, and yet assume um, that, well, what I see is factual, is the truth, and it really prevents us from entering into these conversations with the necessary curiosity to start with a question, as opposed to start with a confrontation and the desire to educate people. And whether that's engaging your kids in a conversation of coming with curiosity, and newsflash, when young people in like grade two look at that slide, most of them find more of the Fs. If anything, they, they lose the one in scientific. Um, but the OVs, they're still you know, looking at little words because they haven't learned how to skim for meaning and ignore meaningless words. Uh, OVs are awesome words because they can spell them. Um, and so it is one of those things of when you engage your child, being able to engage your child with curiosity of like, what was going on for you? Where was that coming from? As opposed to assuming that I know fully well why they're doing what they're doing and I'm coming in with reprimand energy or education energy as opposed to listen first curious energy first Sandy and Dave take it a little bit further in terms of other challenges that you see with uh, that keep us stuck or having troubles having these simple clarifying conversations hmm. Yeah, well, I I have an example that uh, that I experienced just this morning, in fact. <laughs> <Fresh>. um, <laughs> so these things happen all the time. I mean, I see I see this this kind of almost like almost literally like every minute or every hour, right? I mean, yeah. we have these kinds of moments. So um, I think I have mentioned before on these Friday sessions that uh, my two teenage boys are struggling with engaging in their online classroom activities and assignments as required by their school in this pandemic time. And uh, so as part of that, uh, the teachers have kind of been, I think, you know, making some attempts to keep the parents in the loop about kind of the progress of their kids, et cetera. And uh, so I had some awareness that um, my oldest son, who is 18 in grade 12 and should be able to manage these things on his own, um, has, been, has fallen expectation behind. Expectation exactly. in that little box, there's, there's expectation. expectation. There's my expectation. So he's fallen behind and we've had several conversations about this in the past. And uh, in particular, there was um, two assignments that the teacher was asking specifically about teacher had emailed me, copied Nicholas. We'd had a conversation about it in terms of his plan for getting these, delivering on these things. And okay, so that's all fine. Uh, we made a plan, uh, created the expectations and, um, and so, okay, excellent, carry on. Um, had a conversation yesterday, just touching base about it. Yep, everything's on track, good, good, good. This morning, bing, bing, into my inbox, email from Mr. Berg saying, I still have not seen these assignments. Mm -hmm. So immediately, right, in my head, I'm like, what the what, right? And, and so I'm like, okay, I, I, I need to, I need to just, chill here for a minute, um, shift my energy because I was assured that this was all in hand and clearly it is not. So, um, so anyway, so I, I, I went and I approached my son and it, it was like, knock, knock, knock on the door. Hey, you have a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got an email this morning from Mr. Berg, I said, um, and, uh, and he looked at me and he said, about what? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard now, right? Like I'm working hard. I just said uh, about those two assignments that seem to be <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, really? Cause I handed them in yesterday. And I was like, you did? <laughs> because I don't think he got them because he's asking me about them. 
And he was like, no, 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 I did. Let me go check on Google Classroom and da 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 da. So anyways, it turned out that he actually had, had handed in these two assignments, like he said he had. Um, and if I had gone into that conversation with the energy that I felt inside <laughs> <laughs> about, you know, uh, you know, making the assumption that he hadn't followed through the way that he said he had and those kinds of things, that conversation would not have gone well. Right. And so turned out that, that maybe he handed it in electronically on the Google classroom in a place that Mr. Berg hadn't looked or whatever. Anyways, they got it all sorted out and it's all good. Um, but I, you know, it, it was, it was just another kind of quick reminder of sort of like the need to kind of, even when you think that you, that you clearly like the teacher wouldn't be emailing me about these assignments if he, if he had them. Right. Um, no, you know, there, there is maybe some other kind of explanation or whatever. And so, um, that was for me that, that, that was a moment where I had to work really hard not to kind of go in there and, um, and, you know, start with start with the hard energy that I was feeling in that moment in terms of the assumptions that I was making uh, based on the information that I had right oh for sure so the action of you get Mr. Berg's email and it goes through your filter of like we've had these conversations this has been going on and it lands uh, what were some of those emotions that you initially had oh my gosh it was like a, he told me that he'd done this. He hadn't done it. So I was like, he lied Betrayal. to me. He's lying. Betrayal, he's lying. Anger, um, frustration, yeah. um, you know, almost embarrassment, right? Uh, I can't believe this is happening. Totally. This is my son. He should be more <laughs> mature and responsible. And if you had come in with that kind of energy of, I need to tee this person up, I need to drop the truth bomb on them. And you know, what a different kind of conversation. Right. Especially I mean, especially uh, given uh, that it had yeah. actually been taken care of and it's there's a miss here because yeah. life happens yeah. and we miss things. And being able to come in with, with a question as your starting point created space for that discovery without doing damage to the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think when I like, like literally when I opened that email, the words that came literally out of my mouth were, What the heck, Nicholas? Right. And then were I those and then, literally the word Sandy. Oh, they actually were. They actually <laughs> all were. good for you. And, <laughs> and, and I, and yeah, and, and I, I wanted to march over to his room and say those words. And yeah. I, that for was, sure. yep. So Dave, why don't you walk us through a little bit of, um, some of the inner workings are going on in terms of how to discipline, like the, the, the exercise that Sandy had to do in terms of the self-restraint and, and disciplining your mind to be able to actually have that conversation, because that is challenging stuff. And you'll have to unmute yourself, my friend, before you dive in. Excellent. Yeah, that was a great story. Um, interesting to listen to. And I noticed somebody, I think Jenny, Jeannie, I'm not sure if I'm saying it, whether that's Jenny or Jeannie Alexander saying, Jeannie, yeah. Jeannie saying uh, that happens to me too, but I don't work as hard and I can relate sometimes. We don't always catch it, right? Um, but yeah, before you take an action, there has to be a narrative in your mind. You have to reach, uh, you have to tell yourself a story before you react, right? And so it's in that, fertile ground of your mind that enemies are made or pieces made first right and so good for sandy to catch that um, or at least find out more info in a more curious way before coming in with the hammer because i know i've made the mistake as a parent as a dad of coming in with a hammer and then it's kind of embarrassing actually when you realize especially when you realize i'm a professional at this <laughs> and my kids know that and they're like come on papa <laughs> aren't you supposed to be Let's talk, as David said, just a little bit about the minds piece of this a bit more. Uh, maybe I'll just set this up by saying many years ago now, I think it's 21 years ago, I was sitting in a, literally sitting in a mindfulness class where we were learning to do mindfulness meditation. And I was there for three days. Um, and it was a lot of sitting and watching your thoughts. And um, I have to admit by mid-morning of Saturday, we'd started this on Friday afternoon, mid-morning Saturday, I was feeling like, what could possibly be the purpose of sitting there with your back straight, you know, imagining that there's a little fishing line coming through the top of your head and just noticing your breath 
And when thoughts came into your head, the instruction was to notice the thought, say thinking, and come back to your breath. And there's a bit more to it than that, but that's the gist of it. And we're doing this. It was very frustrating for me by morning too, because I'm like, what is the point of this? I have taxes that need to be filed. I have other duties. I need to get over to the grocery store and pick some things up. We got some people. I was really frustrated. And my mind was already making stories about this whole process. And what are these people? Wing nuts anyway. Why, like, why are they? They haven't explained this. And, and during a question period uh, uh, that we had with the instructors, they allowed for questions. One woman, young woman, younger than me, I was like about 30 at the time. She spoke up and said, um, can I ask, why are we doing this? And I was like, yes, finally. She goes, actually, she said a bad word. She said, why the hell are we doing this? And that really captured the energy for a lot. The instructor spoke up, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, we are doing this because we want to take control of our minds and our lives rather than having our thoughts and feelings run us around. We want to be uh, managing our thoughts and feelings, training our little puppy. Uh, but then he shifted to this matter. He's like, your mind is like a little puppy. You have to train it. Otherwise, it's going to run wild and it's going to chew on things and it's going to pee on everything. And your mind is, in a sense, immature. Sandy's nodding. She has some dogs. I've seen them. They are wild. Um, you know, your mind's like that dog or he said your mind is also like a parrot. And this is the image that I've never forgotten that we've really brought into our work. Um, how's your mind like a parrot? Well, your mind, uh, the parrot sits on your shoulder and what does it do? Uh, the parrot can really, the, 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 the trick parrots are most famous for, at least some of them, is that they can mimic a human voice like no other creature I think we know, but it's not a real dialogue, right? The parrot sits there and it repeats to you the things that you say. Saying, oh, well, what was it you said? What the heck? What the heck? Nicholas. Um, the parrot's like, what the heck, Netflix? And it's like, we've been through this. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. And off we go, right? And we're, we're cycling up into a mindset that uh, can lead us to war making, quite frankly. It can lead us to a little bit more mildly, less dramatically, can lead us to making judgments and things come out of our mouth based on assumptions. To go back to that earlier model, model I know David Falk is saying, uh, is fond of saying, this is a high risk behavior this, because those are high risk assumptions that you're basing your next action on. And you could make the situation anything from somewhat worse to immeasurably, immeasurably worse. And now you've added an additional, con, additional problem that you have to solve, which was your reaction to the whole thing in the first place, right? So all this to say that a big part of conflict management, uh, especially as a leader or parent, is managing our internal dialogue being aware of the puppy, being aware of the parrot. And I had a guy say to me one of the first times I taught this in one of my conflict management classes, he was like, well, I guess what we got to do is we got to shoot the parrot. <clears throat> and, just, and, and, you know, the class laughed, but I said, no, don't kill the parrot. That's your mind, right? And your mind is your friend. It's not like thoughts are bad. It's like, but we need a buffer so we're not seeing our thoughts as capital R reality. They're just our thoughts. And I, for one, enjoy my, enjoy walking on the street, having thoughts, ideas about work. I often think I'm quite funny, so I amuse myself with my own thoughts. That's good fun. But if I took that as reality, now I've created a problem, right? I want to share one quick illustration about this from the Black Lives Matter stuff that just popped in my head as we were talking. Uh, some of you know about the NFL. Some of you don't know pro sports at all, but it doesn't really matter. There's a quarterback by the name of Drew Brees who plays for the New Orleans Saints. And he did a, I think, a Instagram or a Twitter post about a Black Lives Matter in which he, he revisited the issue of um, Colin Ka Kaepernick, Kaepernick, Kaepernick uh, who about uh, four years ago now, and many people believe he's been shunned by the NFL since he initiated this kneeling on one knee during the uh, national anthem of the United States not as a gesture of disrespect to the flag or the country, but as a way of saying, um, I'm still showing respect, I think, and I can't fully stand until I'm allowed to fully stand in this, in this country because there's too much oppression of black, black people, too much injustice of people of color. Um, and I gotta, I gotta make a small symbolic gesture. And of course, many people picked that up and there was a lot of judgment, but, but Drew Brees in his, in his post said, where's the effect of, I support Black Lives Matter. However, I can never support the thing where people kneel on one knee because I cannot support disrespect for the flag. And then he went on to talk about 
his grandfathers who served in the Second World War and how he gets quite emotional when they play the anthem. And the flag represents all of that to him. And I think what was happening, you know, um, he was making a story. And again, he was going back to an old story about what the kneeling was about um, and what human beings don't fully understand or what we don't know we make up. So he's filling and he's kind of writing a novel about it in his head. This means that, anyway, long story shorter, one of his teammates, the safety on the team, for those of you who care about positions. So Drew, Drew, Kreese is the, Drew, Drew, Drew Brees is the quarterback. Uh, Malcolm Jen Jenkins plays uh, defense for them. And he shot a little video. There's a couple of teammates, but you, I invite you to check it out. It's about four minutes long. And I actually thought he was very emotional, but he was calling out his teammate, the quarterback, and he's like, we go to battle with you. When we break that huddle, we go to war with you. And we know you love us, Drew, but you screwed up here, basically, because you're making assumptions that are not accurate about what we mean when we're down on one knee. It's not about disrespecting the flag. It's about that other stuff I mentioned. And he said, you need to know your history more because my relatives came back from the Second World War and they got spat upon and they got ridiculed and they were subject to violence because they dared to wear their military uniform. They weren't well like heroes so know your history about this country and he, he ended kind of gently but the gist of it was drew i'm still i'm still your teammate but i can't let this slide and i'm, I'm disappointed and you drew breeze to his credit has since issued an apology but to me that was a teammate checking in about maybe breeze allowing the parrot too much to dictate what, what, what his interpretation of the behaviors, rather than checking maybe with a teammate like Malcolm Jenkins and saying, tell me what your take on, I see that behavior, I'm having a reaction, can you tell me more about what that means for you, right? I think part of the frustration of the folks um, in solidarity with, with African Americans, other people of color, is they feel like they've explained this to us as white people many, many times, and they have, and we're, that narrative in our heads is so strong that we, we're not we're not on top of it, right? And we're still making that enemy when we need to, we need to re reassess what our thinking is on the subject. So anyway, not to get into a, a full-scale political lecture here, but the parrot, our mind, the little doggy, is a big part of these moments, and it's all about slowing down to notice that um, rather than making assumptions. Absolutely. I think uh, one of the little sayings that we are uh, often share with clients or in uh, training sessions is this, very simple idea. Don't believe everything you see. That one, since the day of sh Photoshop, we've all kind of realized the wisdom of that. But also, don't believe everything you think. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. It's, it's a theory. It might be true, but it might not. And so that idea of how to manage that internal dialogue, um, one of the pieces that we have found super helpful in that is just simply recognizing that when you have a judgmental thought, and you realize you're cooking up a good conspiracy theory, it's not helpful to that morning, at that moment when you realize you're cooking up a negative story uh, to then turn on yourself and go, oh, I'm such a bad person, I'm being so judgmental, because now you've turned from having a conspiracy theory about someone else to now judging yourself. And that internal parrot is not only fantastic at beating up other people, oh, she's a jerk, a yeah, total jerk, but it's also really powerful at destroying ourselves. It is the same voice of the inner critic where you go, oh, I'm such a loser. I'm so judgmental. And the little parrot goes, yeah, you're a loser. You're so judgmental. And so when you recognize that you have that moment of judgment where you realize you're cooking up a conspiracy theory about why someone did something, um, what we have found helpful in that moment in terms of a basic kind of mantra to kind of work with is just recognize that, you know what, you might be right. First move, you've already thought the thought, you've already thought the judgmental thought, so just say to yourself, you know what, I might be right, and your parrot's gonna love it and just go, might be right, but then acknowledge, I might be wrong. And your parrot will repeat that too, I might be wrong, and then acknowledge reality, which is at this point, I don't know why that person wrote that email. I don't know why they made that statement on their Twitter handle. I don't know where they're coming from. And if you have any history, personal relational history with that individual or with people like that, you're likely to cycle back up to this, go, oh, hell no, I know why they said that. And you'll probably have to say this little mantra to yourself another two or three times in terms of going, I might be right, I might be wrong, I don't know, to get to the point where you are calming your mind and able to then enter into the conversation if you choose to have a conversation with curiosity, as opposed to coming into that conversation with your mind made up 
and filled with judgment. Because in that context, even if you follow the model and ask a question, your judgment will leak out in how you ask the question. So uh, uh, where are things at, Nicholas, with your homework assignment? It's going to leak out in your tone and your body language as opposed to saying, hey, I got an email from Mr. whoever that teacher's name was, I'm wondering where things are at. Um, and if you really are struggling with uh, getting your mind to kind of a neutral to the benefit of doubt, and this is truly what benefit of doubt is, is just acknowledging that you don't know where they're coming from. It's not assuming that everyone is all about rainbows, love, and unicorn. It's just saying, I don't know where they're coming from. Um, if you need to really push yourself, then you might want to ask yourself, why might a reasonable and rational person actually act the way they did? Why might a reasonable and rational person make a post that I find incredibly ignorant? Well, it might be because that reasonable and rational person has been so amazingly sheltered and has not had um, anyone prior to this actually come up and respectfully educate them in terms of the impact of their words and the nature of history of oppression in Canada and the US, right? Maybe no one has actually had the conversation around that. And I know years ago, I had someone, for example, who came up to me and gave me feedback around some gendered language. Uh, and it's not even years ago, I think not too long ago, Sandy had a conversation with me about some other language, right? And said, hey, you're saying this and well, what's that about, right? And it's, it's helpful when you realize, oh, good, helpful, professional people can say things at times that are really quite off-putting and hurtful. And how do you learn, right? And so I had someone pulled me aside years ago and said, yeah, can you not say general rule? You know, you're saying this, what's that about? I'm like, oh, I'm just, or not saying rule of thumb, I should say, I can't even remember the proper term, right? Don't say the rule of thumb. Um, and I had no idea about the British common law history behind that statement of, you know, uh, the rules around what you're allowed to beat your wife and children with, as opposed to going, you know what, now that I am aware, I can make a change. I can change my action. That's not a hard task to do in terms of going general rule as opposed to some colloquialism that is problematic and that uh, some find highly offensive and quite frankly, is just sloppy use of a dead metaphor that most people don't even know where the metaphor comes from. And so how do we have those type of gracious conversations to call each other out on things that offend, whether they are statements, um, whether they are colloquialisms that are past their best before date, um, and being able to have a conversation by first entering into it, recognizing that, you know what, the person maybe was doing that intentionally, but maybe not, I don't know. And then if need be asking yourself, why might a reasonable rational person actually have said or done that? Um, so that it doesn't, you're not doing that to be able to excuse them. Um, but it's about getting yourself in a place where you might be able to have the conversation, um, with your colleague or with your spouse or with your kid in a space that has the greatest hope for some insight and some engagement. All righty. Yeah, so I just wanna, I just wanna um, emphasize, David, I like your point about why might a reasonable and rational person be, behave that way? Assuming people are not evil um, necessarily, most of us don't wake up in the morning trying to do destructive things and then taking a, grace, a gracious, curious, and loving approach. Uh, and, and in that example I shared with the two players, uh, I think there was love there, even though pretty much person two was in an educational mode. Um, and I think it has to do with the history, right? And the repeated nature of some of those, those things. So it's, I just want to acknowledge that sometimes you know what they're thinking or you, you're pretty sure you do because you've been on the, maybe on the receiving end of some oppression over many years. But I think this is an everyday skill and I'll just echo, uh, David used this with me yesterday uh, without getting into all the detail. I'll just say there were, we had a, a morning meeting with our team. I was, I was facilitating the meeting and giving some input and he phoned me at the end of the day, he reached out to me and said, can we have a quick FaceTime chat about um, this morning's meeting? I said, sure, and I'll call you in 10 minutes. Anyway, we chatted, and the long and the short of it was he was just, want, in a very gracious way, he was like, I just want to figure out what you meant when you said X, because I was a bit triggered, and I was able to say, oh, uh, I wasn't thinking of it that way, and I, I didn't mean it that way. And he said, well, I didn't think you did, but I just, I just needed to check it, because I was out walking my dogs, and I realized what I was triggered about and I needed to call you. So I just want to share that because I feel like sometimes people think, 
well, the, well, surely when you reach an expertise stage, you don't have, you know, you won't make those missteps anymore. And I think not at all, right? I, I step in it every week, probably multiple times with people. And what I hope they will do is what David did with me yesterday or what Sandy did with David a few weeks ago. Uh, that's the goal we're trying to live by versus thinking we can be perfect. Yeah, and it is, I think, this idea of these simple perspective checks where you're trying to respond proactively to a pinch. One of the barriers is that when you're the person who's pinched, often it's like, I don't feel like having a conversation. Why do I have to be the bigger person? I want them to come and apologize to me now. And the challenge is to remind yourself is that despite the obvious nature of the pinch to you, the other person might have absolutely no clue that they said or did anything that caused you to be having the experience that you're having. That that is, uh, if you're waiting for them to apologize, you might be waiting a really, really long time and never actually get what you're hoping for. Um, and so it's, it's challenging. The same principle that we're talking about in terms of how to recover from these simple moments. Also, for those of you who watch some of our other um, Facilitation Fridays, it, it also rolls into a, kind of some of the best practice that we have around how to do feedback, which is just take the conversation when it's a feedback conversation, when you're in a position of power as a supervisor or as parent or whatever, um, take the conversation incrementally only as far as you need to get the other person engaged in the conversation with you, as opposed to doing the dump and go conflict technique or feedback technique, where you back up the truck of beep, 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 and then dump your feedback on a person and vroom, dis disengage and walk away from them and leave them under this kind of crushing criticism. And so the idea with, uh, with the feedback model that we've been advocating for years now is this idea of, again, making the approach and pausing which showing up and when you're showing up and you're the parent or you're the supervisor, that power differential, the person who is not in the position of power is very aware of your presence when you show up because you have authority in that context and you show up and you're like, Hey, how's it going? Pause. And at that point, when you show up and make the approach and pause, often people will at that moment engage and confess their crime, if you will. And I've experienced this myself where, you know, I made a major blunder in a training years ago. Um, and the person who wasn't in the training but had hired me for the event, uh, we had lunch together. And he's like, so how's the training going, David? And it gave me the doorway to go, oh, not great. I screwed up this morning. Have you heard about it? He's like, yeah, about five minutes after it happened. Uh, but it was so gracious that he gave me that space to actually engage with him in the conversation as opposed to him over-educating me. And coming in saying, David, you really screwed up this morning, blah, 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 which would have probably triggered shame and defensiveness and all that kind of stuff. So it's about how do we have honest, tough conversations? Because we did have to talk about stuff. Um, but how do we get um, kind of create the container, if you will, for that conversation so the other person um, has as much safety and dignity and the ability to be engaged with us as a caring, competent, albeit very imperfect person, just like we are also caring, competent, and very imperfect people um, having that conversation. So anything, Sandy, before we pivot to looking at um, the idea of when it's someone else's pinch that they're coming to us to say, this person's an idiot, and they're coming to gripe to us about it. Anything else you want to chime in on this parent business? No, I mean, just to say that um, I think it's, it's a discipline, right? Like it, yeah. it's something, it's a discipline, it's a practice. It's something that you never kind of like, oh, I got that one licked, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's part of, I think, life, life journey stuff. And, um, and so, yeah, just part of like, yeah, we talk about making friends with the parrot, right? Um, it's, uh, and it's just part of, yeah, part of the ongoing journey. And I don't have much more to say about it than that. Yeah, learning to notice your thoughts and then learning how to actually manage your thoughts. Yeah. Um, and pretty much every wisdom and uh, tradition around the globe has some fundamental teachings that they have and practices that they encourage around learning to recognize and discipline one's thoughts as opposed to having your thoughts run you wild. Mm -hmm. So part of the challenge is that when people come to us with their conflicts, when you're the third party, you're the friend, you're the supervisor, you're the spouse, you're the partner, whatever, right? when people come to us with their troubles that they have with other individuals, how other people have pinched them, often they come to us with this kind of plea of help, what should I do in this situation? 
And uh, we want to just kind of end off our last 20 minutes here with just a real quick touch on uh, a couple fundamentals to be mindful of, of how this might apply or influence um, how you handle those kind of tricky moments where folks are trying to bring you their troubles and ask you to help them. So there's two primary ways that we get caught up when people come to us with their troubles. And I'm going to walk you through this model, a way that we used to illustrate it using basic triangulation dynamics. So if one and two are two different people, and if that little red line represents their relationship, they have tension in their relationship, and let's represent that with a little squiggly line. So there it is. Ideally, they have one of these perspective check kind of conversations. They clear the air with each other, and they're back to things being stable and productive. Wouldn't that be awesome? But in reality, often they hold on to issues. They start maybe having additional pinches occur. And at some point in time, one of those people might reach out to you as a colleague or as a friend or a family member and say, help. And when they come to us with that tension, asking for help, the pitfall that many of us fall into is we leave number one hanging in some way, shape or form where they don't feel like they're getting our support. And we might do this by trying to explain away number two's um, perspective. And in doing so, it looks like we're taking sides. Uh, we might try to minimize it. Oh, well, it's not that important. Or, well, you need to know that's the kind of person that they are, explaining their personality, their character traits or flaws. And however we're doing it, when we start defending number two, what ends up typically happening is one now is frustrated with us because they came to us for help and we didn't help them. And they're still frustrated with number two because number two is still doing things that are annoying and troubling for them. So that's kind of the first kind of move where we leave a person hanging. Or another version of this, we say we're gonna do something about it, especially in leadership roles. Okay, thanks for sharing. And then we don't do anything or we do something, but it's so confidential, we don't cycle back to number one that it's perceived that we're doing nothing, which destroys our kind of credibility. And when that happens, number one, because they have all this upset, all this instability to go back to uh, the pinch crunch map that when they have a, now a pinch with the number two and with us, have loads of instability, they're going to try to find someone to stabilize their life with, and they'll choose better this time. They'll find someone who is going to be a like-minded deviant who will agree with them, and they'll go, you know what? My colleague is an idiot, and that person's like, oh, yeah, I know, and then I went to my supervisor, and they were no help. They're so useless, and that new number three, their colleague is like, yeah, I know, and they have this faux kind of stability. They found someone who agrees with them, and it gives them a sense of comfort. And at the same time, there's all this instability that exists in these primary other relationships. So if you want to curb gossip within the workplace, find ways of actually providing support and not leaving people hanging. The other way that gets us into trouble is that people come to us with their tension and we don't want to leave them hanging, so we take up the cause. And in taking up the cause, we're like, okay, I'll deal with it. And we take number one's concern and we bring that to number two. We might do it um, within the workplace in a very vague way. Hey, I need to let you know, um, Dave, uh, there's been some concerns raised. And when you're doing that, the anonymous criticizer, the anonymous critic, the person that you're raising that concern with instantly will say, well, who has concerns? And often us leaders will say, well, I can't say that's confidential. And when you do that move, boom, you've just lost credibility and you're losing trust because you are now becoming a mouthpiece for nameless, faceless accusers. And most people have a huge defensive reaction to that. They need to protect themselves from being falsely accused. And they'll accuse us of taking the other person's side without first getting all the facts, which is kind of true because we haven't had an honest, curious conversation. We formed a conclusion that number one's version of reality is truthful, is the full story. And now we're teeing up the other individual and having this you know, confrontation or feedback conversation with them. The other version of this is we choose to actually disclose, right? So I come to you know, my colleague Dave and say, yeah, no, I was talking with Sandy earlier today and you need to know that what you said was really offensive to her and I'm now the mouthpiece for my business partner, Sandy, to my other business partner, Dave. And when you do that, well, you've just invited a whole not, a lot of trouble because you are now becoming the spokesperson that you're carrying the water. Number two, Dave will probably be frustrated with Sandy for going behind his back and not having the courage and the courtesy to have a direct conversation with him and also mad at me for taking up her cause and considering that perspective to be the full end of story conversation. Um, and these things can escalate completely out of control when you don't manage them well. Um, so one hospital case I had, two frontline workers, they had tension, 
one member went to their in-scope supervisor, a member of their same bargaining unit and said, help, that person tried to be helpful and tried to have a conversation with that colleague. Hey, would you mind doing this? Be a little bit more mindful of that. That conversation did not go well. And so that you know, frontline leader or frontline staff person, I should say, number two, jumped out of the work unit to their union representative and said, help. And the union representative called up that in-scope supervisor and said, why are you harassing number two? That conversation, of course, didn't go well. So the in-scope unionized supervisor jumped to an out-of-scope non-unionized manager and said, help. That person called up the union um, representative and said, why are you, and use the B word, why are you bullying your own union members? That didn't go well. So now we've got this union staffer escalating up to their superiors. By the time we got the phone call, the union president and the C-suite executives of the hospital, chief nursing officer, chief operating officer, were all having this big proxy war because there are two frontline technicians not getting along. And we have all these people who are picking up other people's drama, trying to be the hero and save the day. And our job was to essentially help push it all the way back down to these people need some support to deal with their issues. And so when you're trying to figure out how to do that, um, it's about trying to figure out how can I help an individual come up with their own strategy for dealing with their pinch or their tension that they might have with a colleague, as opposed to either leaving them hanging or taking up the cause. So Dave, you wanna do a quick rendition of the options here. You're muted, my friend. Sorry about that. Um, we're thinking in terms of the, the coaching yeah, model sure. process or the, sometimes I'm, I've, I've taken a calling to say, uh, a conversational guide to supporting others through the, throughout, because you can use it for obviously conflict situations like David was saying, but you can also use this guide uh, anytime you're trying to help another person think through their, their dilemma, their situation, the thing that's causing them anxiety, frustration, fear, whatever, and you, you can use this model. So really briefly, I'll just say it's a six step flow. And um, I don't know, David, if you want to pop that up there, that little uh, mic. So it's called a coaching process here. Um, now, I thought we had changed that middle word, but I'll, I'll change it for you right now. I mean, because it's the same thing, really, in a way. I'm, I'm just going to run through these steps quickly. There's listen, and it includes venting often. That's why the vent was there at first, right? But we sort of recently said, you know, venting isn't the core of the process. Venting is something that maybe the coachee does, but the coach or the supporting leader is actually providing active listening. I think about it as empowering, big ears, big heart, active listening, rule of the four Fs, feelings first, facts follow. That's where the empathy comes in, validating emotions. That's the core of the process. From there, step two is clarify. Um, doing some active listening, some open-ended questions, sometimes we call them probing, some paraphrasing, some summarizing, helps us sharpen our mutual understanding of what the core issues are for this person. What are their key concerns or interests, needs, fears that are emerging. Uh, step three, imagine. I always think of the John Lennon song here. I won't try to plague you with it, although Sandy, I think, has a better voice, so maybe she can do that for us later. But we're trying to imagine a different reality. So it's helping person get beyond now the thorns that they've been talking about. Thorns are the things that bother them to the rose, like the thorns and the roses. Like what's the thing they actually want versus just staying on, maybe harping on what they don't like. And so using a question here, like, so tell me what, you know, what this could look like if you were to wake up in two weeks and things were trending better in a month between you and X, you and person X, how would they be? What might feel different as you were coming to work in the morning? Uh, from there, we're going to step four, which is they need to make up, start thinking about what their choices are. Um, choose a step four. So they're choosing, you're not choosing. Do they want to let it go? David, just pop this slide up. Here's some options. Do they want to, after thinking this through with you, is it possible they want to change how they're viewing in the situation or how they're acting? Like maybe as you dialogue with them, you, you share the metaphor of the parrot. If you're going to do that, it's often helpful to illustrate it with your own story of how you, may, you found yourself making an assumption that wasn't entirely accurate. And so you can sometimes coach them up and they start, yeah, okay, maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. Maybe, maybe I do need to reassess uh, how I've been approaching this other person. Or they may decide, you know what, I do need to talk to the other person about this. 
um, and you can help support them to think through that plan, that piece of the choice, and help them to prepare for what will that conversation look like? How could they approach the other person in a way that's less likely to get their, the other person's back up, more likely to elicit a safe space to share where, where the second person was coming from? Um, so talking to that person in a functional, straightforward, but, but gracious way. Um, step five, uh, or uh, another option there is, a step uh, option number four is, somebody may need to support and facilitate the situation. Um, so they may say, you know what, I could, I am prepared to talk to them, but I need your help. Um, or I need someone's help to have that conversation in a safe way. Um, sometimes there's like, I need to get more information. I need to, uh, seek out what is some objective criteria about how we might handle this. And I can do some more homework. A final option there is maybe we do need to hire formalize, go to a more formal process, uh, engage a higher authority. Um, in some capacity to make some kind of decision or help us figure out what we do. So those are just some of the options under the choice category. Whatever they choose to do, the uh, fifth slice is prepare. So we're going to prepare them to execute that plan, to implement their, their plan as effectively as possible. As a leader, as a coach, as a parent, we're working with this person to uh, make the steps to their plan. And then the final step there says follow up. I also can think of sometimes, I was talking to Sandy the other day, um, a broader term would be support. They may need your support to take that next step. You're figuring out what those next steps are. They may need your support in terms of follow-up, talking about how it went. But follow-up support sort of go together. Um, we've been doing a Dear Jennifer blog. Jennifer works in the healthcare system. I'll just share very briefly one story or one situation. She really recently wrote me an email saying, uh, in my environment as the Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, economy starts to reopen. People start uh, letting, you know, reducing some of the concerns. There's been more gatherings that have been allowed formally, and also people are kind of letting their guard down a little bit, noticing not. And she said, in my healthcare environment, people have different comfort zones with how to handle the lowered restrictions. And some people are more casual about it, and some people are more strict about it, and they're pissing each other off. But what they're not doing is talking to each other. And she said, how could I help them? to take the steps they need to take and speak to each other. So I shared with her, listen, clarify, imagine, choose, prep and support. Listen in that environment could be saying to one of the say nurses that she works with, say more about what's going on for you in, in terms of the way this other nurse or doctor is approaching risk right now. That'd be listen, clarify would be, so it sounds like his approach feels a bit cavalier to you and you feel scared, right? Yes, if things were better with this issue of distancing and opening things up and maybe better with this doctor, how would they be? That's the imagine piece. What are you looking for? What are you hoping for here? Uh, step four would be, so what might you or what might we actually do next, right? Like um, what, what bucket are we in? Sometimes we talk about three buckets. Do you just need a vent here? Um, do you need me to assist you in some way? Or do you need, uh, fix comes up with, do we need some performance management here or even progressive discipline? Or the third option is, do we need to talk about this? And I could coach you up for that, uh, having the conversation with him. Maybe I sit in and kind of do a small M mediation with you. So those are some of the things that she'd be doing under choice. Fifth would be, uh, how can you start the, the prepare piece with how could you start or approach the conversation with the doctor about the issue of um, social distancing and and the different measures that are in place and risk management, how could you start that in a way that would be more likely to enlist his positive engagement, less likely to just get his back up and turn into fight talk. And then the follow-up might be, so have you talked to him yet? How did that go? What else do you need from me, right? And that was in a healthcare environment. So this is a coaching model that we can use um, really in any situation, not just with conflict. I know my colleague Eleanor told me a story the other day about using a coaching process with her son who is facing some dilemmas in an educational environment and, and receiving a mark that he wasn't totally pleased with and trying to figure out what to do there. And Eleanor there, I see she's actually on the screen. This would be her story to tell. I should be a little careful. But I found it inspiring to hear the way she used this coaching supportive process with her son, not for a conflict-based matter, and stayed non-anxious as a mom instead of trying to just roll in there and tell him where he's wrong or become the rescuer and go and, you know, let light into that professor who gave him a poor mark. That's the whole, you know, save the person technique that our, our model that David was talking about, right? Um, you know, she could leave her son hanging too. She didn't do that. So I found that inspiring 
on a more personal level of application. Thanks, Dave. And so that coaching process is also another way that you can take a pinch when it's not your pinch, but someone's coming to you with the unmet expectations that they experience. And so I love your dear Jennifer example of people, they have expectations, assumptions about what the COVID protocols should or should not be. They haven't necessarily talked and agreed. They have different kind of ideas and people are doing things that are violating those expectations. And when those expectations get violated, does it just lead to big open drama on the ward? Or do we find ways of having conversations with each other to either clear up a misunderstanding or a mistake? Or is it a conversation that we need to have that goes all the way up here where we get on the same page, we actually take the time to clarify what is our protocol at this time, given that we're early June and we're no longer in the same environment that we were a month ago. Um, and it's, I think, just a helpful map to be able to kind of recognize these choice points that when a pinch happens, I, as a person feeling pinched, I have options at this moment, some more constructive than others. And I think it's helpful to kind of, when you have that moment, kind of assess, is this, you know, is this um, issue going to matter in five minutes or five hours or five days? Or is it something I can you know, truly let go? Or if I let go of it, will I actually still be kind of honestly hanging on to it? And if so, how do I deal with it? And how do I deal with it by managing my mind, slowing down my judgment, recognizing my judgment and going, it might be true, but maybe not, don't know. And having that honest, curious conversation. Or if things do go up here and someone comes to you post crunch, be able to, again, coach them and help them think through their options of how to recover, of how to be able to find a way to engage and possibly um, work things out with their colleague or their significant other. And those type of opportunities, they are, you know, if not daily, weekly opportunities to help people prevent, manage, and resolve conflict as constructively as possible. Sandy, you want to take us home with some closing thoughts and comments about where we're going next week? Yeah, so um, we're coming up to, believe it or not, middle of June, um, and it feels quite shocking to me that that's where we are at in the in the calendar cycle um and so so as david and dave and i were talking about where we're taking this series um sort of feels like we're we're at the stage where we're gonna take a bit of a summer pause so next week is going to be our last uh session of this free facilitation friday um hour and a half long conversation that we've been having um, and uh, we're gonna think about over the summer what exactly we want, uh, what exactly this might, may or may not look like kind of in the, in the, coming, in the coming months. Um, so this has been, been a, a really great um, opportunity for us to uh, you know, talk about the work that we do. It, it's actually been really fun. Um, and, uh, it's been fun to kind of have you all along, uh, as an odd, as an audience and, uh, engaged, um, folks kind of joining us for that next week, we're actually going to have kind of an open conversation where we actually are going to invite you all to kind of engage with us and have a bit of a more informal conversation with some Q and A and um, sort of see where that conversation goes. We've got lots of, uh, obviously lots of um, content up our sleeves as always. Um, and so we just wanna open up that conversation um, and engage, uh, engage the rest of you. Recognizing, you know, it, one of the challenges that, that, uh, that we've found with this platform is that it, it has felt really one directional um, in terms of the conversation. Part of that is because of the time frame that we're working with. And so we are looking forward to engaging with you differently next week um, and, uh, and having a conversation that feels a little bit more uh, with you folks engaged than just sort of three of us up here having a conversation. So um, thanks all to, uh, for, for you for being here and uh, just really appreciate your engagement. And uh, yeah, we'll be interested in, in hearing, hearing from you next weekend. Any closing remarks for the rest of you from Dave, David? Well, I just put in the comments there the idea that 
I don't know if it's seven or eight sessions we've done. I've lost track, but if people want to go back and look on our website, we'll be posting some resources from today. You can actually look back at the previous sessions and remind yourself of some of the ground we've covered. Maybe it, it, it jogs your memory about, oh yeah, <clears throat> I really did want to discuss or follow up with this piece. So that's an option. And of course, we can just chat as well, but, but I know we have covered a lot of content here. And I just echo what Sandy said. I think we've had a blast doing it. Um, so we're not saying necessarily the end of uh, facilitation Fridays for all time, but I think we're going to take a summer break and, and reassess. I think it's yeah. been, you know. Absolutely. So yeah. The grand and so, wrap up next week. Yeah, absolutely. And just to echo what, uh, what Dave said about all of the past content is up on our homepage on our workplaceconflict.ca site. So I noted GDU had uh, wondered about forwarding this to your networks. Feel free to do that. Um, and feel free to invite others to the conversation next week as well. The more the barrier, right? So um, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate uh, your time today, and uh, we'll see you next week.